Today, October 22, is a very significant day in the history of our beginnings. Welcome to the Avenus History Podcast, episode 30, I Fought the Law. Last time we met A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagoner, two young preachers who would clash with the entrenched leadership of the church, specifically General Conference President George Ida Butler and Review Editor Uriah Smith. Now, round one was between Jones and Smith over which tribes fed on the carcass of the Western Roman Empire, and we kept in mind that all of this was unfolding under the specter of Sunday laws, which led to Avenus being arrested for working on Sunday. In this episode, we get to round two. Ding, ding. While the debate over the Ten Horns was going on between Jones and Smith, a new front opened up between Wagner and Butler. This was over Wagner's views on the law of Galatians. Now, George Knight, the venerable historian of the Avenus Church, introduces it this way in one of his books. Quote, if the crisis over the ten horns was intense, that generated by the issue of what law the book of Galatians was talking about was literally explosive. End quote. Literally explosive, George? Literally? Who knew theology could be so much fun? Okay, so you should know that nobody dies in this Adventist civil war. It is, in fact, rated PG-13, not because of violence, but because of excessive sarcasm and halfway decent insults which we will get into in our next episode. So cover your ears if that PG-13 rating scares you off. Now, if the church didn't encourage anyone to fight in the Civil War, do you think they're really going to take up arms over issues of interpretation? Not a chance. It's not that kind of war. I just call it the Avenue Civil War because it had the very real possibility of splitting the church in two. So this second theater of operations opened up when Butler heard the heresy that E.J. Wagner had been teaching at Healdsburg College. So what's this heresy, you ask? You're going to want to pay attention here because these next few episodes won't make any sense at all if you don't get this down. So there's two steps to understanding what Wagner and Butler were going on about. Step one. In the biblical book of Galatians, chapter 3, Paul mentions that God's law was given in order to teach human beings. Paul then writes, But after faith has come, we are no longer under a teacher. So the law was a teacher, and when Jesus came, we no longer need a teacher. You've graduated. Congrats. Now, step two, Adventists had taught for about 30 years that the law Paul was talking about was the ceremonial law, also known as the boring parts of Exodus and Leviticus. Laws about mold in your house, or offering sacrifices to God, that sort of thing. What Jones and Wags were doing was to say, no, Paul isn't talking about the ceremonial law here, but the moral law, the Ten Commandments, the don't steal, don't commit adultery laws. Among them, of course, is the law to keep the Sabbath. So putting step one and step two together, does this mean that the Ten Commandments are no longer our teacher since Jesus is here? It's okay to kill and lie and not keep the Sabbath? So for Jones and Wagner to teach that the law Paul is talking about in Galatians is the Ten Commandments and not the ceremonial law as the rest of the church believed, well, that set off alarms everywhere. George Ida Butler, Uriah Smith warned that these two young preachers were undermining the entire church because the Adventist church without the Ten Commandments, without the Sabbath, is what? And we always have to keep in mind, as we said before, that all of this is happening while Sunday laws are being passed across America, making it illegal in most cases to work on Sunday. Adventists felt they were only a half step away from finding their own faith banned and their own members persecuted. There was this incredible tension, fear of the laws, but also excitement that this meant that Jesus might be coming soon. And here are two young preachers, it seems, who were trying to trip everyone up on the one yard line. Didn't the Bible say false prophets would come in the end? The law in Galatians issue didn't even cause Butler and Smith to blink when confronted with it. They'd been here before. 
In the 1850s, James White, J.N. Andrews, Joseph Bates, and Uriah Smith had all believed, as Jones and this younger Wagner did now, that this law in Galatians was the Ten Commandments. They all believed that. Back then, Joseph H. Wagner, E.J. Wagner's father, had even written a book about it. But then the church studied the issue more carefully, realized that this law in Galatians wasn't about the Ten Commandments at all, but the ceremonial laws. And that's why Butler knew at once where this nonsense was coming from. It seemed to him that old Joseph Wagner had never really come over to their side on the issue. And now Joseph Wagner was in charge of the Pacific Press with Jones and his son serving out there as editors. It didn't take a rocket scientist or whatever the 19th century equivalent of that was to see where young Wagner was getting his ideas from. The apple had fallen pretty near the tree. Butler wrote to Ellen White, who was in Sweden at the time, and complained that the two young preachers were teaching an interpretation of the Bible that was against what the church believed. Butler was pretty casual about it. He briefed Ellen on the issue like he was the chief of the CIA. The letter basically goes something like this. I heard this news that these two young guys were teaching this bad interpretation at the college out there. This isn't new. As you'll recall, Ellen, James, Uriah, Can, right? I, we, all of us used to hold this view. But then we realized it didn't hold water. It's not true. And it seems that J.H. Wagner has rubbed off on them. This is a potentially dangerous belief, and I noticed that they are starting to publish it in Signs of the Times. Didn't you have a vision about this some years ago? And Butler left it at that. The implication, of course, was that Ellen White should do something about it, right? She should nip this thing in the bud. For the next two years, the General Conference president sent letter after letter after letter after letter to Ellen White, begging her to do something, anything to solve this. One prophetic word from her could have prevented the coming conflict, or at least that's how it seemed to him. Each letter that Butler sent was more frantic and a little bit more manipulative than the last. George Knight mused that had Butler been more successful at manipulating Ellen White on this issue, he might have written a book called How to Push a Prophet, because that's what he was doing. Now, you have to give Butler some credit for being a decisive leader here. The Signs of the Times out west was publishing one interpretation that was at odds with what the vast majority of the church believed, and the review out east was standing by another. Critics of the church would certainly notice before too long and have a field day with it. He wrote to Ellen White, I do feel we have presented a divided front long enough on this question. Now, even Willie White agreed with this, right? You can't have one publication on one side and another publication on the other. Willie kind of had a bird's eye view of the whole affair. He wrote a friend with his typical understatement that it was too bad that we had two schools teaching two different views. While Willie sympathized with Wagner, he could see the pieces moving across the board, and it wasn't looking good for those in the West. We need to remember that the vast, vast majority of Adventists still lived east of the Rockies. And I'm using the Rockies as the boundary here between east and west. The communication between the two halves of the country took a long time, leading to the perception that the west was kind of an Adventist colony in a, in a faraway place, far away from headquarters, a distant land. For instance, Willie notes that the leaders of California hadn't had much contact with the review lately, which only fed suspicions that those people in California were up to something. Why haven't we heard from them lately? Joseph Wagner really only made things worse. At a church event, he was found laying down on a pew with his head in the lap of a married woman. Now, this is the 1800s, and it seems that Wagner found in this woman what we would probably call today a soulmate in the most platonic sense, now, I know our modern minds want to read between the lines here, but there's no reason whatsoever to think that it was anything more than this. It was just, as Ellen White called it, unlawful intimacy. People talked. It ruined his reputation as a leader in the Seventh-day Adventist church. To Ellen White, it showed a profound lack of judgment, lack of concern for his own influence as a role model to the young. That Elder Wagner 
a married man should be resting his head in the lap of another married woman just does not sound good. And the fact that he didn't really respond to Ellen White in a timely manner, well, that led to concern that the 1886 General Conference wouldn't even renew his ministerial credentials. And unfortunately, that cloud that hung over Joseph Wagner in the eyes of the church also cast some shade on both his son and A.T. Jones by association. There was something off about California, something suspicious. The General Conference president told Ellen White that since young E.J. Wagner had started publishing his views, well, then he would do the same. So Butler wrote an 85-page book. And so the issue escalated. Wagner writes articles. Butler writes a book. What do you think Wagner does next? He writes two books. I'm just kidding. But he did write a book eventually. As Wagner and Butler critiqued each other and wrote more and more on the subject, the crack between them widened into a chasm. People began to take sides. What made it even worse was the rhetoric used by Butler and Smith. To them, nothing short of the survival of Adventism was at stake here. The church's critics often pointed to Galatians to prove that the law was no longer valid. And they had responded that this law was the ceremonial law, not the Ten Commandments. That was the Adventist defense. And now Jones and Wagner seem to be intent on proving the critics right. Uriah Smith remarked that if the church accepted Wagner's view on this, then he was out of there. He was done. Butler said that if the church accepted Wagner's view on this, then they would soon get rid of the Sabbath and Ellen White too. Jones and Wagner never saw it this way. After Butler had told Wagner that it would be humiliating for us to change our view on this law in Galatians, Wagner seemed genuinely puzzled. Why would it be humiliating? Isn't it better to be right than prideful? It's not shameful to correct our view of something. To Wagner, correcting your own views showed strength. It showed humility. It was a very Protestant, very Adventist thing to do. But Butler didn't see it that way. Clearly, this wasn't going to be settled by the pen. We need to get Wagner and Butler in the same room, which is what the 1886 General Conference was for. Butler did not come unprepared to the General Conference session at the end of 1886. He was a very formidable leader. First, he gave every delegate there a copy of his book on Galatians that he had written because he's a nice guy and in no way wanted to influence people to agree with him. His second action was to recommend a committee be formed to settle the issues of the ten horns of Daniel and the law in Galatians. About ten people were on this committee, including Wagner. Now, Butler wasn't corrupt. He didn't stack it only with his own people. He had no problem with Wagner being on the committee, but most of the rest of the people weren't necessarily fans of Wagner's views. Butler advocated for an official church statement on the issue that would settle it once and for all, and not just any old church statement either, but one that agreed with his views, of course. You remember when we talked about Butler's essay on leadership in the 1870s? Do you remember why the church ultimately objected to parts of it? because they recognized in Butler that his philosophy of leadership was a little too autocratic, too much like a dictator. And so they tried to fix it. They edited those parts out. So the words in the essay may have been fixed, but the ideas were still in Butler's mind. And that's the problem. And here's a free, good rule of thumb for you leaders out there. You will seldom ever settle a controversial issue in your organization with a vote from the executive committee. So Butler simultaneously gave everyone a book in order to persuade them and then also hoped to use general conference power to silence anyone who wasn't persuaded. I don't say that as if his goal was to be a dictator. It, it wasn't. His goal was to save the church from Jones and Wagner. His supporters saw his good intentions. His opponents saw his dangerous use of power. Now, this committee debated the issue and sided with Butler by a vote of five to four. Sure, 
Let's make a statement against Jones's view of the Ten Horns and Wagner's views on Galatians. Let's make it dogma. Let's make it policy. But the debate was apparently strong enough to convince Butler that he had best not take it out of committee. The committee's recommendation would have to be taken to the floor of the general conference where all 71 delegates would weigh in. And if the committee vote was any reflection of how the rest of the delegates would feel about the issue, it being a 5-4 split, then it was just going to be too close. Butler was too intelligent of a politician to make this mistake. Getting 51% of the delegates on his side was hardly a victory. But Butler wasn't done. The committee did approve a policy that no one would be permitted to teach controversial ideas publicly that weren't believed by a majority of Adventists. If anyone wanted to publish a controversial teaching, they had to first run it by church leadership. It's difficult to imagine that this wasn't squarely aimed at Jones and Wagner. It's hard to believe, also, that Wagner would vote for his own censure. So while we don't know exactly what the vote on this issue was, it passed sufficiently. So the 1886 General Conference at best put a band-aid over the problem. Butler won a small victory there, but his use of power only deepened the division between the two camps. Ellen White had been coy about the whole affair thus far. Butler had practically begged her to intervene and decide the matter, but she would always stay just out of arm's reach. We could say that she was busy in Europe to follow every twist and turn of this complicated issue, but the truth is she kept herself pretty well informed. Ellen White never saw her role as a prophet to settle theological debates. Ellen White roundly came down on Joseph Wagner for his offense, but it should have been telling to Butler and company that she didn't immediately react to Jones and Wagner the way that they did. And that meant that she didn't agree with Butler's argument that the younger men were undermining Adventism. If she had, she probably would have nipped it in the bud in the beginning. But because Ellen White saw it as an issue for the theologians, she left it alone. The 1886 General Conference left her disgusted with both sides. She didn't like the divisive tone or the fact that it was being carried on so publicly. So she chastised both sides in private letters. Butler reacted defensively. She said his book was promoting division, and he couldn't see it. He told her, look, I know you're going to disagree with this, but they're far more divisive on their side than we are over here. You notice the language where you're seeing an us and them differentiation between East and West. Then Butler added, nothing short of a testimony from heaven would change my mind on this point either. Butler was not a villain. His basic point was, I'm just trying to keep the church together. I didn't ask for this. Wagner started it when he started publishing his views in the paper. So I wrote a book and replied to him because I think his view is dangerous. Isn't that my job as a leader? Butler was sincere. But it's clear Ellen White didn't manage to persuade him that he had done anything wrong. In early January 1887, Willie White wrote to Stephen Haskell, Bring Joseph Wagner to England. Apparently the old pioneer of the church had turned himself around sufficiently and it didn't hurt that making Elder Wagner a missionary also got him out of California. And then Willie dealt with the controversial issue at hand. It's hard to say how much Willie's views reflect his mother's, but once again he comes across as kind of detached, like he has this whole picture in view from afar, which makes sense. It's, he's in Europe and far removed from the action. But it's also because Willie, like his mom, didn't feel qualified to dive into these deep theological debates. The son of the Adventist prophet had never attended an Adventist college. People were saying that Willie encouraged Wagner to write his articles on Galatians. And Willie told Haskell that that wasn't the case. On the contrary, he thought their publication was rather unwise. But Willie was slow, like everybody else, to comprehend the danger of rumors, like this one, which would just continue to grow like nasty weeds in this debate. Was Willie secretly behind this? Was Ellen secretly behind this? These rumors would just grow and grow and grow. Willie was also continually surprised at how deeply Butler and Smith 
felt over the whole affair. He nor his mom could ever understand Butler's fierce passion over the issue. Nor could Willie understand why it was just so hard to correct any mistaken views and move on. He wrote, quote, It seems to me that when we get where our positions cannot be improved, then we shall be in the same condition as the Lutherans and other denominations that have fossilized and rejected the possibility of improving in any of their positions. End quote. In Willie's mind, the uniqueness of the Adventist church was that she should always be open to changing her beliefs when presented with better evidence. We talked about how much the church fought against creeds, and they weren't so much against the words of the creeds as if they all have bad ideas, so much as the idea of a statement of faith that was in itself unquestionable. Of course, that's all easier said than done. And here, Butler and Smith were treating Wagner as a traitor for daring to question their interpretation of Galatians. Letters were flying around in early 1887 as Ellen White finally determined to sort this mess out. She wrote a real big letter to Jones and Wagner, telling them that she didn't think Wagner's view was entirely correct, and that he especially should have been more careful about causing this controversy in any case, she said, the stuff about Galatians and the ten horns are not super important in the scheme of things, so let's not make a mountain out of a molehill. She worried that too many pastors were arguing about these doctrinal points when people needed to know Jesus. Both Jones and Wagner took their medicine well. Wagner decided to hold off publishing his book on Galatians for a little while, and they both apologized with Wagner saying that if he could do it all over again, he wouldn't have made his views so public and caused this mess. He just had no idea that this is where this was going to go. Butler almost became Pentecostal in celebration. He received a copy of these letters, and he praised God for all his goodness to him and said that now that he thinks about it, he really loves Jones and Wagner. He pities them because Ellen's rebuke to them must be a really hard blow. Poor kids. He even complained about how powerless he felt at the last general conference, something that surely must have caused Ellen White to choke on her baguette. Powerless, Hum Butler? You're the general conference president. You presided over a committee that managed to muzzle Jones and Wagner from teaching this anymore. You gave out your book that you wrote on the subject to everyone there. Yeah, I really feel so bad for your powerlessness. Butler completely misread Ellen White's letter to Jones and Wagner. She wasn't siding with Butler against them. She just thought that there were faults on both sides. And the fact that the two young preachers reacted humbly and Butler reacted so jubilantly did not go well with her. And when Butler ended up publishing an article in the review about the law and Galatians issue, thus reopening it once again, she lost it. Dear brothers Butler and Smith, she wrote them. And here's my paraphrase of that letter. I didn't send you those letters rebuking Jones and Wagner so you could use them as a weapon against them. I sent you them so that I wouldn't have to waste time writing you guys the exact same things to work on. You should have learned from those letters, not rejoiced over the rebuke of your brothers. Those letters didn't mean that your views are right and theirs are wrong. Oh, and because you published an article about this issue and started this thing again, I'm going to give Wagner the same opportunity. All the while, there was something that needed to be kept in mind. This is what she said, quote, The religion of Christ, I testify, is not one of gloom, but of gladness. We will move steadfastly on, looking to Jesus, learning of Jesus, obtaining the love of Jesus, our hearts melted in tenderness toward each other, end quote. This was to be her theme over and over in the controversy in the years that followed. In fact, this was her theme for the rest of her life. Her best and most beloved books about Jesus would be written in the aftermath of this. She was just so thoroughly fed up with the way that people were treating each other in this. Ellen White also told Butler and Smith about a kind of creepy dream she had. Butler, Smith, and D.M. Canwright were on a boat in the dark. And Canwright was going on about his views of the law which were also Butler's views, which were also Smith's views. Ellen White saw that neither man saw where Canwright's views were going. And while Canwright talked and talked and talked, he was also slowly turning down the light of a lamp until it got darker and darker. Canwright 
was the major casualty of the 1886 General Conference. He began the affair firmly on Butler's side of the issue. But as he heard Wagner's arguments, it seems he got frustrated with the confusion on the whole issue and decided that, you know what, neither man is right, and if neither man is right, then Adventism is wrong. So he left. And this time he wasn't coming back. He would later claim that Adventism had exalted the law above Jesus, which honestly was pretty close to the mark. Sadly, he didn't wait around just one more year to see Jones and Wagner and Ellen White work to fix that. I mean, we saw Ellen White trying to fix that in early 1887 even. Canwright would become a successful Baptist preacher, but he also became the first major perpetual critic who would make a career out of bashing the Adventist church. Canwright would spend the rest of his life criticizing the Adventist church in general and Ellen White in particular. He called her a false prophet, published a few books to prove it. He became such a huge thorn in the side of the church for many decades. But curiously enough, he would eventually attend Ellen White's funeral. This woman, he said, was a false prophet. And according to one witness, he remarked, there's a noble Christian woman gone. Now, I don't know that we'll ever fully understand Canwright, this side of heaven. If he truly said that at Ellen White's funeral, was it a moment of honesty and vulnerability? Or perhaps Canwright would always miss Adventism somewhere deep inside, but left in order to take out his frustration with how they handled this issue on the law in Galatians. Whatever the case, his defection was a bitter blow in 1887. It did nothing to help resolve the tensions over Galatians. What we really need at this point is for Ellen to come home. By August 4th, 1887, she was boarding the SS City of Rome, a comfortable and a little overweight steamer that would make that Atlantic journey in eight days. Ellen White was coming home. Thank you.